are putting in writers. So I just got it like an outline. And on Friday, when I sat down in the computer, I said, now, look, we, we got to go to work, and you have to help me put this together, and what comes first, and what goes last. And that day, again, like today, two, two of my devotionals were, were based on, on the theme of love. So I said, wow, Lord, you just, you just keep, you're just so good. You just keep encouraging me. And this is what you want me to share with, with your people. But remember, he shared it with me first. And this is about me, not about anybody. It's about me and the walk with the Lord. If it touches me, praise God. But I'm not talking about anybody. It's about me. And I want to um, lay a little sort of like a foundation. I learned when I first got saved that teaching the Word of God is explaining it. And when we preach the Word, we are actually like proclaiming it. And I want to do just a little bit of a teaching before at the foundation. And I'm going to read out of a, a book, one, one of my favorite authors, this is Watchman Lee, mm -hmm. who is a very profound, in my opinion, uh, Christian, was anyway, he said. And um, out of his little book called Teach, Watch, and Stand. This is what he said. Of all of, of all of Paul's epistles, it is in the teachings that we find the highest truth concerning the Christian life. This letter abounds with spiritual riches, and yet at the same time is intensely practical. The first half of the letter of Ephesians reveals our life in Christ to be one of a union with Him in the highest places. And when you read that scripture, and Mary, would you look it up and read it, Ephesians 2 and 2, so that you won't read Ephesians 2 and 2? Can you read it? Yes, what, what scripture is Ephesians 2 and 2? Ephesians 2 and 2. Huh? Ephesians 2 and 2. Just, just read it for the Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Verse 2. Verse 2. I want to read it to you. That's okay. That's okay. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. All right. Thank you. So why did you just read? We are where? Where, where are we? We are seated. The Christian life begins eating, resting. So it says here, the first half of the letter reveals the life in Christ to be one of being with him in the highest heaven. So we're sitting. We're not standing. We're not walking. We are sitting. The two half shows us in, in very practical terms how for the heavenly life is to be lived by us down here on earth. Resting. In the first section of the letter, we know the word sit. Mary just read it. Which is the key to, the, to that section and the secret of the true Christian experience. God has made us to sit for Christ in heavenly places. And every Christian must begin his spiritual life from that place of prayer. Now, in the second part of the book of Ephesians, we find the word walk. 
which is the subject of that part. We are challenged there to display in our Christian walk a conduct that is in keeping with our high calling. We must walk in a certain way, not just what we want to do. Amen. And we have the scriptures. So the doctrinal part is talking about the position. How? What's my position? It's up there with Jesus with it. But then the practical part is what we do, how we And the thing about it is that even though the position doesn't, it's immutable, it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. We're up there. But then there's the thing called condition. Mm -hmm. And it will always show in your position. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you, because see, we have to come and be, I, I found, I found something very interesting when I was putting the message together. That the Word of God is not that difficult to understand. I mean, it's, it's very, really plain. And then nowadays we have so many um, translations to, to, make them, to make the Word of God even more uh, interesting and more clear. So, therefore, we got no excuse not to do the word. Mm -hmm. We don't have an excuse. Because if you read it and then you don't do it, you got a problem because if you understood what you read, you're called to be doers of the word. In the book of James, it says, don't be only hearers, do what the word says. You know, that made me think about, and in, in a minute I'll go into the message, but it made me think about when God created uh, Adam. Everything, when Adam appeared in the scene, Adam didn't have to do anything. God did all the work, everything. He prepared the place for Adam, and then comes Adam. All he had to do was maintain. We know that he, you know, got in trouble. But it made me think about that resting thing. Because he didn't have to do anything. Just take care of what I've already done for you. So there was rest. He wasn't working. Even God rested on the seventh day. And, and the thing is, we're, we're supposed to be dead in Christ. And then alive, right? We, we're dead. We're dead people. How many of you have seen a corpse talking and doing whatever, carrying on? We're supposed to be dead, but alive in him. This life in Christ is not, it's not he and Jesus. It's Jesus, all Jesus. Yeah. And me cooperating with the Spirit of God, with, with who will allow me to live this life. Because nobody can live this life. Is there too many, too much sin? Where, where grace, where sin abounds, grace abounds again the more. But we don't have a. What's the problem here? <laughs> The thing is that when we come to the Lord, we we are not perfect. We're going to be perfected through Him, you know. Until we're here on earth, God will continue working in us and through us. Um, we have to work on that thing called condition. You know, my condition is not right. I'm not perfect until... God keeps, you know, we, we as Christians have to keep reading the word and being doers of the word because that process of sanctification needs to take place. So we have to study the word. We have to study the word and then we have to do the word. We're just not going to study it and, and we have to become doers of the word. Mm 
I mean, love is action, you all. Love is action. You cannot tell me you love me, and then you don't do nothing to show me that you do love me. When you love, you give. Always. Jesus, God gave. And he gave his best. Jesus didn't come and he gave his life. What are you giving? What are we giving? If we love, we give. And we give the best. It is just this, this new, this born again thing. It's just like um, when a baby is born in a natural, we need the help of others, the parents, the family, and they help us to, you know, the baby first, uh, everything you have to do for that baby. And then he learns how to crawl and then walk, and he by himself or herself. Um, that's what we're supposed to be doing in the spiritual. We grow this process of God coming into my life and doing away with everything that is uh, uh, fleshly. It has to go away. It has to go away. We go through a process for of like a metamorphosis, and and that made me think about Jacob because when Jacob fought with the angel of the Lord, he had to come to the place where he had to at least go to war. You know, he fought, and, and God allowed him to fight. But God had something in mind with Jacob that day. He's going to wrestle, I'm going to just let him get, get to the end of his strength, and when he can't do anything else, even though he never let go, because he was just, you know, such tenacity, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Um, it was his this is what God wanted all along. He put him in a place where Jacob would have people come and and say, he says, what's your name? And I'm not going to tell him, why, why are you asking me what's my name? But see, with that confession, with him saying who I was, my name is Jacob. Jacob was actually saying, I'm a supplanter. I'm not a supplanter. He had to come to that place where he could have been. Nobody, and I, I mean, seeing this today and some of the stuff that I read, it made me think so much of I said, Lord, until I see myself, how I am, how dirty, how ugly I am, I, I can't even begin to, to partake of that love. And, and then I want you to do that. You have to see yourself as who you are and admit it and come to me, God, and say, This is who I am, and I'll say, Yes. Now, who else do you want? Because see, that's what God wants. He sees it. You cannot come to the Lord and continue being the same person I was before I came to Him. He wants us to just come, come and, and, and be peaceful. So that nature, that same nature, I remember Jacob. something very interesting about them telling him this there. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, he knows that Abraham was a type of what? God. Isaac is a type of Jesus. And then we have Jacob. What's that? He got the new nature. He got healed. He repented. He started living the right way. So, are we supposed to in the same way? Not to be on the side of the victim. So, now I'm going to go into we're going to read some scripture and then of the word and, and because the scriptures are very clear so then what's the excuse why am I not growing why am I stagnant 
there's something I'm not doing. So um, I thought, you know, rather than than just because when God came and talked to me, He wasn't asking me for my opinion. I don't want to give you my opinion because it doesn't amount to a of me. Um, but in reading the scriptures, you're gonna see yourself right there. And um, that's what we want to do this morning. You know, in Romans 8, 5 through 8, and I have it here. I'm going to read it. What I want to prove to you is that the real battle is not between me and, and Satan. That's part of the whole thing, but it's just not so the real, real battle. The real battle is between the spirit and my flesh. I want to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. That's not going to do, it's not going to be good. It's not going to work with God. So it says here, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is dead. If we keep doing what the, the, the flesh wants, I mean, we, we are dying. Oh, yeah. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Mm -hmm. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Do you ever stop and think that when you're just letting your flesh do what it wants to, that you're being hostile towards the God, towards God? Mm -hmm. Have we ever just stop and think about that? Mm -hmm. So those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot be God. That's just it. Very simple, very clear. If I'm being fleshly, I'm not pleasing God. Are you okay with that? But then it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So I'm going to submit to you something, and I'm going to read another scripture that goes together with this. There are mainly two types of people here. Those that are being led by the Spirit of God, who are the children of God, and then in, in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 3, I'm going to read you something. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as on the, could not speak unto you as on the spiritual, but as unto carnal, mm -hmm. even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with meal and not with me. For hither though ye, ye were not able to bear it, neither you, now you're not able. For you are carnal. For where there is among you envying and strife and division, are you not carnal? So there's the two types that kind of just, you know, they're up there. Either you are children of God and being led by the Spirit of God, or you are a carnal, still Christian. I remind you, still Christian, but being governed by the Spirit. Those are the two types we find. Mm. I want to read just a little bit about the listening and the doing in James 1. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Quick to listen. Why do we have two ears? <laughs> One <laughs> mouth. Slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of what, who, who is going to get rid? Who is going to be uh, like getting rid? Okay, we got, we got it. We understand that part, right? We are going to get all, rid of all the moral skills and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. So he says that if I'm just listening to the word, I, I'm doing what? I'm deceiving myself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does, does not do it is like someone who looks in the mirror and then after looking at the mirror goes away immediately forgets how he looks like. How is that? How could you forget how you look like? So, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in all they do. Now, in John 
14, verses 23 and 24, and I said we were going to read the scriptures because I want the scriptures to be the talking. Amen. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Amen. Just very plain, very clear. Do you love Jesus? How are you going to prove to God that you love him? By obeying. My father will love them and will come to them and make a home with them. Anyone who does not love me, see, is, 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 it, is it that difficult to understand that he said, do you love me? Then obey me. Obey what my word says. Who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Uh, that's John 14, verses 23 and 24. Then we have, we're going to talk all about love today. It's about love. Matthew 22, verses 36 and 40, the greatest commandment. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So we all love to God first. First and foremost. No difficult understanding that, right? No difficult. And the second is just like it. He says, Thou shalt love thy brother as thyself. I'm supposed to love you in the same manner I love myself. Do you think I'll be doing damage to myself? Then I shouldn't be damaging my brother and my sister. But that's the only way for me to show God that I love him, that I love him and I love my my brothers and sisters. There's no other way but it's very plain. I had a I had a scripture that wasn't really in my message, it was because I, I copied and pasted on another paper and there I have Proverbs 9 and 10, and it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Where is that reverential love and fear today among us? Where's the fear of God? Before doing anything or saying anything that you know is wrong, do you actually stop and think about it before you open your mouth? So, and then he goes on to say, and the second is like unto me, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. Mm. We're supposed to exercise that loving rule. Whatever I want from me, I should want to do. Then we have something that we, we have touched on it so eloquently <laughs> about unforgiveness. Mm. I'm going to read two scriptures that. Talk about it in two different ways. In Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. Go do things right. Reconcile to them, then come after and offer your gift. This is how important it is to God. He says, I don't want your gift. I'd rather you obey me, you go, go go do things right, make things right, reconcile. And I do say, I will have to add to this, that reconciliation is not always possible. You can decide, I'm going to forgive if the other person may not want to forgive. But you need to let go. You know, this is a, this is one part that it always gets always gets me because the word of God says that if if I bind something here on earth, it's bound in heaven. So if you are on um, you have unforgiveness towards somebody, you're both bound. And then you may be trying to to ask for something, a healing or something, and then you wonder why. Well, you got him both bonding. God can't, see, God can't do anything because he's not going to go against his word. His word says, you, you have them bound here? They're bound over there until you let go. So which is it going to be? 
So this is the first example is about you. It falls on you. Um, So the second example is out of Mark 11, verses 24 through 26. Mark 11, 24 through 26. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold again anything against anyone to give them so that your father in heaven may forgive you too. So one is when I if I know about someone who has something against me and then the second example is about me having something against somebody else. So God's covered it. It's covered. We don't have an excuse. And it's so important he says I don't want your gift. You go do the right thing. And then come back and bring that gift. But before, I don't want it. I just don't want it. Just keep it. I was reading some months ago one of my devotionals, and something just stopped me when I read this. It said, Oh, forgiveness stops faith from working because faith works by love, and love always forgives. And I mean, I just have to stop because it's saying, Oh, forgive stops faith from working. So we may be. And then Galatians, he made me think about Galatians 5 and 6. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through what? Through love. So that faith is not flowing if I have a forgiveness. Because it, it, it just, like what Vera was talking about, the tight being so full of stuff that the that the love of God couldn't flow, that the power of God could not flow, because it was unstopped by the things that were in there that needed to go. We may be trying to believe God for healing, but if we harbor all forgiveness in our hearts, our faith will not work. Did we ever? I mean, that really made me think. My faith is not working because I. I am harboring on forgiveness with somebody. That really made me think, really. Contrary to what we may believe, it is not the devil who is not allowing us to forgive, it is all on the flesh. Forgiveness, like love, is not just a feeling, an emotion, it is a decision. I have to come to terms with the word and say, Lord, I'm willing to forgive, I'm willing to let go. Um, because I want to be set free, yeah. and um, and and I let go. I let go of that person or whatever it is, and uh, because I want to be set free, I don't want to be, you know, bound by anything. Yeah. So Jesus takes loving God and one another very, very seriously and very personally. We have that example in. Um, when Paul was persecuting the Christians, do you remember that passage in Acts? I think it's Acts 9. I didn't write it down, but he fell off the horse, and and Jesus, and he knew who it was. He said, who are you, my Lord? But yet, Jesus didn't tell him, why are you persecuting the church, or why are you persecuting my people? He said, why are you persecuting? So when you're persecuting somebody, think twice. You're persecuting Jesus. 
when David, who had all the right probably to kill Saul, and God allowed him twice, not once, but twice. In either occasion, I think Saul was aware that David was in the same place and that David could have killed him. But he decided to do what he says, I am not going to trust my Lord. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. We have the same with Joseph. Joseph could have retaliated against his, his brother, but he didn't do it. And then he saw what? From God's perspective, he said, God, you know, the enemy meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. So he didn't try to, you know, reason with them and, and, and tell them. He didn't say anything. He, he, he rather just, I'm not going to touch them. He understood why God had allowed what he allowed. You know, in my life, there have been twice in, in that I that I have been in a situation where somebody got mad at me, and um, in either situation it wasn't anything that I did. But um, in one occasion, um, this one person, whatever happened, the Lord said he's going to leave a scar. And yeah, he did leave a scar. But do you know he also told me he said whatever happened, I allowed it. Because I'm going to make the relationship even stronger. And up until today, I'm here to tell you that we're still friends. We're still good friends. And, and with this other person, too, um, I, I forgave her right away. I mean, I made the decision right there. And even though I struggled after, and the Lord had to tell me, He said, That's your flesh talking. Just hush. Because I, I said, I should have said this and I should have said that. And he finished your flesh talking. You know, <laughs> you're hurt. You're hurt. She, this person just cut you. And and what you and I think I've said this before, you know, um, because he said it, it, you have a wound. Mm -hmm. And you're hurting. But just like in the natural, um, it, it will heal. What does the word of God say? I make the wound, but I also heal it. So this this sister in the Lord both Occasions have been sisters in the Lord. Um, and like I said, with the one, we're best friends. We are since 20 years, over 20 years of friendship. And this one, the same thing. And it took her longer. It, and in neither case with me, I wasn't the offender. I was on the other side. But in both cases, I decided to forgive. I said, yes, forgive. And he strengthened and made stronger the relationship. God says, I'm going to show you how to walk, not just forgive, but how to walk to forgive. Mm -hmm. And he had me call her every week. It, it, was, it was difficult at first, you know, calling her while I'm still hurting, you know, and hello, how are you doing? And a year later, she called me and said, If I knew that was the Lord, said, she still doesn't want to admit that she did forgive because she said, If I had to, if I had to, if I had to, I forgave you that same day, that very time. Right there, I, I chose to forgive because I knew who was behind it. And um, I said, I know that it has to be made. It has to be made. So I really want to get this out. And like I said, this is a What happened is that I had a couple of people who had a few other people. So this is something that Obeying him. Obeying his word. That's God's language. In Matthew 20, do I read right now? Matthew, in Matthew 25, 34 and 40, whatever we do to others, we're doing it to Jesus. I, I, I talk a little bit about that. You know, in, in, this, in this scripture, this is, uh, it says, Then I, the king, shall say to those at my right, Come, blessed of my father, into the kingdom, prepare for you, 
from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me water. I was a stranger and you invited me to your home. Naked and you clothed me, sick and in prison and you visited me. And then the question is, when did that happen? When did I visit the Jews in, 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 in prison and when did I give you water and when, when, did, I, when, when, when did I close you? Paul in Galatians 2 and 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith and the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And I couldn't help but to think about one of my favorite passages, too, when I read that. It's in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2, where are the, all the messages to the churches. And the one of, to the Ephesians is my favorite because I, I don't know, I just, it just touches me in such a way that Jesus tells them, you know, first of all, he doesn't tell them what he has against them first. He tells them to commend them for their good work. And then he tells them that I have something against you. You are bless your first glory. And I want you to remember. Remember from where you fell. And then I want you to repent. And then I want you to do those things that you used to do when you first came to me. You have to do that thing and go back and do the right thing. <clears throat> in John 3, 16, you know what it, what it says, or it is, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his son and his other son, so that whoever uh, believes in him will have eternal life, and, and it won't perish. And then we have in John 10, 10, it says that the thief comes only to to heal, heal, and destroy. But Jesus says, for I come to give them life and more abundant. And it's not, we don't have to get so, uh, what does he mean by abundant? It's, it's whatever plans and purposes God has for you, that's the abundant life. Amen. So everybody that is allowing Jesus to live through them and, and being obedient, they are already living that abundant life. You don't have to go looking for it. It's not going to be in your life. Then we have the, that love also identifies because it says that um, in John 13 and 35, by these all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That is the only way in the world, that's the only way that anybody will be able to identify you as a follower of Jesus Christ. And then I can't, I couldn't but to think about in John 21, the conversation between Peter and, and Jesus, you know, this is the chapter where he reinstates Peter back into the fold and um, he gives him an assignment and he asks the, the, the apostle three times. And we, we know when we read it that he was a little bit hurt. He says, you know it all. But he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. And he says, God, you know, he says, you know, you know everything. You know that I love you. But see, what really is in there, in between, is Jesus letting Peter know that the only motivation for his obedience to go on and, and see his sheep and his land is if he loves Jesus. If he loves me, the motiva see, uh, my motivation to do anything for God is so close to him is if I love him. 
the motivation is love. If I love him, I'll go and do what he asked me to do. And I always like to say that love is costly. The salvation is free. Everybody, whoever, whosoever, call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then the scripture is very, very clear. In Matthew 16 and 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up his cross and follow me. Discipleship, beloved, will cost you something. We will have to say no to what I want. I will have to pick up my cross. I have a cross to, to carry. Don't forget that. It's not the cross that Jesus bore, but it is my cross. I have a cross. And then, after I deny myself, it's not what I want, and I want it, no. It's what Jesus wants. And then I will follow him. So I have to do those three things if I want to become a disciple of Jesus. Love makes preparation for our heavenly abode. This is all the things that love does. I, 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 I thought, um, the thing that I thought about 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 what about getting getting to uh, obey him and, and go do the things that he wants you to do? That's just um, there's no word to describe that. I I can tell you about myself, and I'm so grateful for those that like. Like Pastor and Sister Renata that probably saw something in me and I didn't see anything. Not God was capable of doing it. If I said yes. And I'll tell you, I always think about a fish in a tank and they always look so happy. This is the happiest I ever am. When I'm doing the will of God. When I'm standing here. And this is the best place ever for me. Because it's what he created me to be. He is what he created me to be. Passion is what's going to give you that peace. It's what's going to give you that joy. Using my father in the natural. There to there. I entered the living 
where I am. I mean, I hear you. I got to the hospital directly and went directly from the airport to the hospital. And she was already in trouble. And I was already in trouble. And I went there. And I went there and I prayed over her. And I, w- I was expecting God to resurrect her. That's how much faith I had. But he, then he told me, because I asked him, I said, why? Why didn't you allow me to see her? He said, because you were, I had plans, and you were going to interfere with them. Mm-hmm. I didn't want you anywhere near her while she was still alive. I got something good out of that. He was just letting me know, you have the faith to pray, and I just have to answer your prayer. So I took him to the mm-hmm. It was God's purpose. And it took me, yeah, it took me 15 minutes. And I think I lost my mind. But anyway, so came the time when I was going down, I finally said, I'm going to go to the hospital. It's now, it was like he was really challenging me. He was giving me a challenge to do the right thing. So I have been, you know, day after day after day coming to the Lord and praying and talking to Him and letting Him dissect every day of all my life. And He's showing me and coaching me. There's sin here. There's something I need to do right here. And it's just kind of scary. It's been months and months and months that I've been at it. See, I had to go through it, you know, she would say, well, go now and pray to her. But this is what we like to do. It is what we like to do. I've been doing it. So, you will find out that nine out of ten times, somebody would rather be right than be right. And nine out of ten times, I assure you, that doing the right thing and doing the most difficult thing to do is It's always difficult. You don't want to do things that you know, it's not easy. I'm not making it, I don't want to make it sound like it's so easy. No, it's not easy to, to let go. It's not easy to uh, forgive. It's not easy to say, no, I'm wrong, you're right. It's not easy. It is a tiny portion. It's probably not. It doesn't come easy. But there is me carrying my cross, and there is me denying myself, and there is me following Jesus. It is costly, I told you, it's going to cost you something. Are you willing? Everything we do is because of him. I can't do nothing. It says, apart from him, I can do nothing. I can't do anything. But he supplies everything. And I, a lot of times, I trust the Lord. I need to be my I tell him, I'm just very honest. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We have to be attached to to the to the to the branches can't do anything. 
vita. And I'm going to put something that is very, this is just the way he put it to me, so I'm not going to put it. Places where I believe Jesus was the most angry. Mm-hmm. I think I would not want to be in that place that day. God wants us to get rid of all the things that are not of Him. What remains is what's going to help us keep going. And um, I, I, I'm I, serious about my walk with Him. Every day I come to Him in prayer and I say, Lord, 
there was a word given in, 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 in a church lately, and it wasn't for me, it was for a specific person, but I took it to heart. And one of the things was to give, just give, just give. And every, every day in prayer, I ask the Lord, where can I give? What can I give? I just want to give. I want to share what I have. I'm here where I am because I can. There was a time when I didn't have anything. When I went through the, I tell you, <laughs> it wasn't easy. But he brought me through. He brought me out. And I'm standing here today because of him. It's very, very difficult for me to understand sometimes that the church is supposed to be a place that is safe. It's supposed to be a haven where we come together and we pray for one another and we love one another and we cherish one another and, 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 and we pray for one another. Yet it has become a thin of rubber. This is the way he put it to me. I'm giving it just the way. I'm not quoting it. It may be serious, you all. Ten virgins were summoned when the bridegroom came, and they thought, all of them, that they were ready. Ten had oil and extra oil, but it's fine. And the other five only had, for the moment, just enough, yes. And then they wanted to borrow, <laughs> too late. They saved the time. The time of preparation is now. The dress rehearsal for the marriage supper of the Lord is now. If you are serious about God, and where you are going to spend eternity, think twice. Whatever needs to be done today, do it. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, if I were you, I would have been already in the altar, trying to make things right. Not for me or anybody else to come and pray for you. Yeah, we will do that. But really, it's more important that you meet with him. He's ready here to set you free, to make things right. It's up to you what you want. And I'm done.